Hey everyone, in Chem 1111 World, it's Dr. Carol here. Welcome to Unit 6, Lecture 3. That's right, we are going to look today at molecular geometries, tetrahedral systems, and others. So I'm going to start with the slides for a bit of variety here, and then go through the textbook. The fact that we know the Lewis diagrams is good. We're going to use that information focusing on the central atom or central atoms to determine molecular geometry. The book call, calls it molecular shapes. I'd rather call it molecular geometries. When you think of geometries, you think of uh, let's see, I thought I could click on here and get a pen shape and now I can't so oh no there it is it's just hidden over there okay so I'm going to use the pen and uh, there we go let's go back a slide so molecular shapes and ge geometries geometries when you think of geometry what do you think of angles well, what we're going to be talking about is bond angles and we use the symbol like this. Some of you I know just use an angle without, but then it might look a little like a less than sign. So that's why I like to put the little arc in there. And uh, length. Okay. We'll be going to talking about bond lengths. So uh, to start, we think of a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron has angles of 109 degrees. We will learn that methane is a tetrahedral molecule that has a tetrahedral molecular geometry. So I'm going to draw a three-dimensional perspective sketch of it. And there you see the angle is more than 90 degrees. It's actually the tetrahedral angle, which is 109.5 degrees. This comes from looking at our focus today, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. VESPER is how we pronounce it. So the book wants to start with showing you how important tetrahedral molecules are and then we'll look at other ones. And um, you might remember that we focus on the central atom which is carbon in this example as opposed to the ligands. There's four ligands here but in the Vesper game we focus on the central atom and we talk about the uh, number of electron groups. As I realize I am low on batteries Okay, there we go. Um, the number of electron groups, I also call that in the Vesper game, the number of Vesper groups, V-S-E-P-R groups, equals the number of bond groups plus the number of lone pairs. So it's the number of bond groups around the central atom plus the number of lone pairs around the central atom. And that equals the number of electron groups or number of Vesper groups. Now we know that molecules have three dimensional shapes. They can. And had the different shapes define the properties of the molecules, how one molecule reacts with another. You can start talking about electron density clouds, enzymes, lock and key mechanisms, all sorts of funny things. How do we predict them? Predict the shapes, we're going to use the VSEPR theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So what it means is electron pairs in the outer shell of an atom repel one another and end up as far away from each other as possible. So, so to minimize their uh, interaction. To minimize their repulsion or their interaction with other electron pairs, valence electron pairs on the central atom. Let's take a step back. Molecules have 3D shapes because orbitals have 3D shapes. Here's methane. Now I'm looking at this and this is, methane isn't 90 degrees so let's look at methane. What I, what's drawn here is a typical Lewis diagram for methane. But that is not the molecular geometry. You focus on the central atom carbon, there's four bond pairs and zero lone pair. So the number of electron groups is the number of bond pairs, 
4 plus 0, which equals 4. Whenever the number of electron groups is 4, we say that the egg, EGG, stands for electron group geometry, is tetrahedral. Okay, those four groups try to get away from each other as much as possible. So you can do better than 90 degrees by going into three dimensions, and you can go to 109 degrees. If there's no lone pairs on the central atom, then the molecular geometry equals the electron group geometry. If and only if it, no lone pairs on central atom. And there aren't in this example. So the egg and the molecular geometry are the same. And the perspective sketch, well, I already drew it. Let's draw it again here. So again, this wedge coming out, I'm going to draw a big H, it's like, ooh, coming out towards you. And then, well, here's another way that some students like better. It's called, it's called the dashed wedge system. So you might have these little dashes going smaller and smaller as you go back. Okay, and here's some other ways to draw it. The shape's tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedron. You have four faces. They're all triangles, all with the same surface area. That makes a tetrahedron. Here's a space-filling ball and stick model. Here's a regular ball and stick model. Here's uh, the shading to show the faces. And here is what I drew. Just rotated 180 degrees. So in the plane of the page, so yeah, here's your carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen, then a hydrogen going out, and a hydrogen going back. So um, that is a very common molecular geometry tetrahedral. Hydrocarbons contain carbon and hydrogen. Alkanes have lots of hydrocarbons, lots of carbon chains. They have big long ones, 40, 60, 100 carbons. Ethane's got two. And you see that tetrahedron twice, right? Here it is, carbon one, carbon two. So you see a tetrahedron if you focus on here, one, two, three, and this whole methyl group can be thought of the fourth group. Go to carbon one, hydrogen, 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 and this whole methyl group, carbon two, can be thought of as one group. So it's a tetrahedron. Here's propane. You see again here in this for the central atom here, carbon two. Let's say let's say this is carbon one, carbon two, carbon three carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3. Carbon 2 has a hydrogen going out towards you, hydrogen going back, and then this whole methyl group with the carbon 1 in the middle there is one group, and C3, the methyl, is the other group. So you see a whole bunch of tetrahedra. The plural of tetrahedron is tetrahedra. So uh, that was a bit of a preamble to... Um, just uh, the importance of the tetrahedron. Let's look at some definitions for the Vesper model. So electron group, a set of electrons that occupies a particular region around an atom. Ligand, an atom or group of atoms bonded to an inner atom. Steric number, okay, this book wants to talk about steric number. I say that's the same thing as the number of Vesper groups or number of electron groups. Steric number is sometimes written as S period, n period. The sum of the number of ligands plus the number of lone pairs. Um, in other words, the total number of groups associated with the atom. So that's another way. I won't use that very often, but it's another way to talk about it. So if you have electron groups, if you've got four electron groups, the egg is going to be tetrahedral. So here's methane. We have four ligands, right? Zero lone pairs. Four ligands, fine, but also I, four electron groups, one, two, three, four. So the egg is tetrahedral, the molecular geometry is tetrahedral. Here we, okay, so this line here is molecular geometry. This one here is ammonia, so we have nitrogen in the middle, you got hydrogen coming out, hydrogen going back, another hydrogen going back, and then a uh, lone pair. So this one, there are three bond groups and one lone pair, three ligands and one lone pair. So the total is still four. So those four blobs try to get away from each other as much as possible. Sometimes the uh, lone pair is written in this little balloon. Some kids say, oh, it's a ghost. They say, oh, there's a ghost going on there. That's okay. You can say that if you want. Um, so 
the molecule cannot be tetrahedral because there's no atom at the top, right? So you can't create a tetrahedron. Rather, you have this diffuse lone pair. And so if you hold it by the lone pair, what you get there is a pyramid. And we usually call it pyramidal. There are other kinds of pyramids. So really, technically, we should say the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal when we have uh, three bond groups and one lone pair around the central atom. Another interesting thing here is that the angle, the bond angle H and H, is going to be a little less than the tetrahedral angle of 109 degrees. The reason being is that the lone pair repels the bond pairs. It pushes them all in. I mean, the bond pairs will try to repel each other, but the lone pair is bigger, so it squeezes in the uh, angle. So the H, H, H and H angle is indeed less than 109 degrees. We can also have a bent molecular geometry. So we have oxygen, hydrogen, and hydrogen. So we have four groups around it, two bond groups and two lone pairs. And so the electron group geometry is still tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is bent. Other ways to say that, and you'll see in some books, V-shaped, angular, and sometimes you'll see it written as bent, off of 109 degrees because there's another bent we'll see later on. Um, so two bond groups, two lone pairs, and the bond angle O or HOH is also less than 109 degrees. What's interesting, since we're in the same rows here, uh, the more lone pairs you have, the more squeezed in they are the uh, um, the more lone pairs, the more squeezed in are the bond angles. So, in fact, if you were to experimentally measure the HOH bond angle, you would find that it was um, around 105 degrees. So the more lone pairs there are, the tighter you squeeze in the angle, assuming the same ligand. If the ligand's different, then it's a different story. Okay. All molecules above the same steric number of electron group geometry. 3D arrangement of the valence shell electron groups. Right. The molecular shape describes how the ligands, not the electron groups, are arranged. Again, this book is using molecular shape. I want to use molecular geometry. So, um, there we have it. We said all that. So, let's look at a bit of a recipe to play uh, the Vesper game. And uh, you determine the Lewis structure, you use the Lewis structure to find the steric numbers for the inner atoms, not the ligands, not, not the outer atoms, but the inner atoms. And then you determine the eggs and get the molecular geometries and then piece it all together. So uh, let's try an example here. Example 612. We want to find everything we can about H3O+. So if I draw the Lewis uh, diagram. I can draw it like um, like this. So I'm going to have oxygen has six valence electrons. Each hydrogen has one, and you lose one. So you have eight valence electrons. Okay, and that's what we have here. So oxygen is the center. We have a balloon going up. We have hydrogen here, hydrogen coming out and hydrogen going back. So that's a perspective sketch of that molecule. The number of Vesper groups or number of electron groups or steric number, they're all synonyms, is going to be three bond groups and one lone pair, so a total of four. Whenever you have four electron groups, the egg, EGG, is tetrahedral. We don't have four ligands though, we only have three, so whenever that's the case, the molecular geometry is pyramidal. Okay? So uh, that's the uh, story there. Um, then uh, we want to describe the shape of chloromethane. Um, it says 
do this. Okay, I'll do it. Chloromethane, ClCH3. Is that going to be lit in here? No, but I can sneak it in the side here. Uh, CHCl3. So carbon, hydrogen, I can have a chlorine here, chlorine going out, chlorine going back. I basically substituted the hydrogens, three of the hydrogens in methane for chlorines. So uh, let me put uh, lone pairs around the ligands and there's a the reason why I do that is to tell you that even though I'm doing that it's not part of Vesper. The ligands lone pairs is not part of the Vesper game. It's the central atoms lone pairs or lack thereof that is part of the Vesper game. So there's four groups around it so the egg is tetrahedral. There's no lone pairs around the central atom so the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. Okay? The bond angles are all roughly 100 and nine degrees. Um, okay, so let's try some more here. Describe the shape of hydroxyl amine. Okay, we can do that. So we're going to have a uh, OH group and then an NH2 group. The OH group is the hydroxyl group, and then the amine is NH2. Drawing the Lewis diagram, you should be becoming experts on this now. Uh, there you have it. And let's double check. 5, 6, 11, 12, 13, 14. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So uh, that's okay. And now I look at the oxygen. See here there's two inner atoms. So this oxygen, the egg, is tetrahedral, right? Because it's got two bond groups and two lone pairs. The, nit the, uh, the molecular geometry is bent off of 109, right? Because there are two uh, bond groups and two lone pairs. The nitrogen, the egg, is also tetrahedral. Okay, you got one, two, three. You got three bond groups and one lone pair. The molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. Okay, so we got N. Um, where should we put the lone pair? I'll put it here. Then we got an H. And then we got an H coming out and an H going back. Uh, no, but we don't have an H going back. Well, we'll put that. Let's make this the oxygen. Okay, so the nitrogen is bonded to the oxygen, and the oxygen is bent. So I can have a uh, let's see, bent right. So around like this, and then I can have a lone pair going out of the board towards you and a lone pair going back. So I'm piecing together a uh, electron group geometry and molecular geometry for hydroxyl amine. And uh, the book, uh, yeah, that's what it sort of looks like on page 277. So uh, maybe I didn't draw the angles perfectly to scale, but there it is. So let's try this one here, practice exercise 613, which talks about um, ethanol. I'll do it on this side of the next slide. So uh, PEX 613, ethanol, which is grain alcohol, CH3CH2OH. Okay, so if I draw just the Lewis diagram, CH3, CH2, and then OH. So here I have three inner atoms, carbon 1, carbon 2, and then the oxygen. Each carbon is tetrahedral, egg, and molecular geometry, but the uh, hydroxyl part, the alcohol part, the oxygen is egg, tetrahedral, but molecular geometry is bent. So if I try to piece this together, let's see, let's put the CH3 on the bottom. Let's try it like this. Hydrogen, hydrogen going out, hydrogen going back. So that's the first one. And then I have a C here. And uh, that's going to be tetrahedral. 
So I'm going to have, uh, well, let's make this fine. Let's make this an oxygen because you know that's going to be a bent part to it. And um, then I'm going to have a hydrogen. Uh, one's coming out towards you and one's going back. Okay, that's not bad. Um, and then we're going to have these lone pairs for the oxygen. Uh, maybe out towards you and then going back away from you. Okay, so, uh, and you can look up and get do a better job than I did to try to get that for uh, the cases where you have more than one um, linear atom. Here you have three. Silicon, the book just sort of did this little diatribe on silicon. I don't think that's a a big a deal. No, I can't get the next slide. Anyways, you can read about that uh, on your own. Let's go to some look at some other molecular shapes. Okay, I'm looking at the textbook. I don't really think, really think I need to go through the textbook pages. This chapter, this at least so far, the slides are good enough. So. Let's look at molecular shapes which have steric numbers other than four. And the only ones that we really care about in this course are steric numbers two, three, well, four, we just looked at that, five, and six. There's only one or two word cases where there's seven. We don't worry about that. So two, three, five, and six. So if the steric number is two, we're talking about a linear electron group geometry. Remember, Vesper starts when you're looking at covalent molecules and they have to be at least three atoms. If there's just two atoms it's uh, you don't need any fancy Vesper stuff. So covalent triatomics and higher like and more than three atoms that's when you use Vesper. You don't use it. If I just have two atoms, if I have hydrogen fluoride well I know darn well that hydrogen fluoride is a linear molecule I don't need any eggs or molecular geometry. I know it has to be linear because there's just two atoms. But if there's three atoms, it could be linear or it could be bent. So here I have three atoms. This is carbon dioxide. And um, the coordination number is two. And the steric number is two. Now, Allison, why, why are they talking about coordination number? Why did they throw that in there? I wouldn't even uh, mention that at all. But the steric number is two. So we say that the number of electron groups is going to be 2 plus 0, which equals 2. Now, here's a tricky part about Vesper, the Vesper game, is that the double bonds and triple bonds only count as one group, like that whole accumulation. Some people call it a high-density region or an electron domain. I've seen, read that as well. Uh, so this glump, I just like to call it a glump. So the double bond is one glump here and another glump here. And the Vesper world, those glumps try to get away from each other as much as possible to create a bond angle of 180 degrees. So the number of electron groups is 2 plus 0, which is 2. And this is going to be a linear molecule. The bond angle is 180 degrees. So the number of electron groups is 2. So linear electron group geometry, linear molecular geometry. They're going to keep calling it shape, aren't they? I'm going to call it geometry. Another example would be hydrogen cyanide. Okay, This triple bond just counts as one. So the number of electron groups is 2 plus 0, which is 2. I don't care about the lone pair of the nitrogen. That's not part of the Vesper game because nitrogen is a outer atom, not an inner atom. So the carbon, I have uh, one group and then the triple bond is another group. So that's two groups. So 2 plus 0 is 2. And so that means this is a linear electron group geometry and there's no lone pair in the central atom. So it's a linear molecular geometry. Okay, SCO. That would be another example of a um, linear uh, electron group geometry, linear molecular geometry. One thing is I'm looking at the carbon dioxide. I want to show you something. This is just going back very quickly to what we looked at before with the formal charges. Some bright-eyed kids say, hey, I could draw carbon dioxide 
a Lewis diagram with a single bond and a triple bond. Can't that be the answer? Why does it have to be a double bond and a double bond? Well, okay. Look at formal charges, right? These are two resonance structures, right? Uh, this oxygen is 6 minus 4, 6 minus 2 is 4, minus 4 is 0, and the carbon is 4, 0, and the oxygen is 0. So the formal charges, if there's two double bonds, they're both 0. For this one here, well, you're going to have a minus 1 because it's going to be 6 minus 1 is 5 minus 6 is 0. So minus 1, 0, and plus 1. 6 minus 3 is 3, minus 2 is 1. And that doesn't give us a good uh, minimum formal charge uh, case. So um, I'm not going to deal with that one. Okay? So uh, the one on the top is a... Uh, the better one to use. So I just thought I would uh, talk about that for a minute. Okay, so um, let's continue on here. Um, trigonal planar electron group geometry. Okay, in a uh, trigonal planar electron group geometry. I shouldn't have written all there, should I? Okay. Um, well, let's let's go to the book now to, to show that since I've mucked it up a bit. Uh, okay, so let's I'm behind the textbook now. The mini text. We looked at methane. Here's a 20 second review showing the tetrahedron, part of the Vesper world. Vesper, by the way, was uh, developed by a guy called uh, well, one guy called Nyholm and one guy called Ron Gillespie, and Gillespie is a Canadian and he's still alive and he has not got the Nobel Prize but some people think he should and he is basically one of the creators of Vesper and he taught at McMaster and he actually taught me a course so I know this guy how about that uh, I'm not his best friend but I did take a course from him so I thought that was sort of cool that I got to take a course from a guy who actually has a theory named for him and uh, millions of students take this <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so we looked at the hydronium ion. We looked at the hydroxylamine, ethanol, silicon. You can look a little bit about that. And um, then we go on. Okay, silicon dated. Lots of details about that. And uh, so linear geometry. I just looked at the linear geometry. Oh, here's one um, molecule that I didn't look at before. This is a weird molecule. Dimethyl zinc actually exists, has a covalent molecule. And you think, really? With a metal? Well, some metals do. So it's a weird metal. And you have uh, two groups so it's linear, two bond groups, no lone pairs. So that's a strange one, but it is a linear molecule, carbon dioxide, we looked at that. Okay, so now uh, we look at three uh, groups around a um, central atom, and we see some example. Here's uh, Let's just look at the ethylene or ethene. The, each carbon has got one, two, three groups, bond groups, and no lone pairs. So each, so the angles are roughly 120 degrees for each carbon. So we say that there's three bond groups and no lone pairs. Right, the double bond just counts as one group. So the egg on carbon on the left is trigonal planar. Some books say triangular planar, but most say trigonal planar. And the carbon on the right is also uh, trigonal planar. So they both are. Okay? The rest of that reaction I don't care so much about. Um, well, okay. You really want to show me another one here? Fine. Aluminum uh, is one of these weird ones which can have a covalent system. And each of those C2H5 groups counts as one group. So its electron group geometry is trigonal planar, its molecular geometry is trigonal planar. 
So this exists. The octet rule is not satisfied, but it does uh, exist. I'm going to sneak one over here, boron trifluoride. This is known as an electron deficient compound, deficient because the octet rule is not satisfied, just like in those other ones. But here I'm using a second row main group atom. So here's a Lewis uh, diagram for it. And you see that the boron has got three bond groups and no lone pairs. So the I was right. Uh, I always sorry, I try to write the electron group uh, geometry number larger than the bond groups, but it's the lone pair, so it's three. So the egg is trigonal planar, and the molecular geometry is trigonal planar as well. So we've got a B F. F, F. So all four atoms are in the same plane. The angles are 120 degrees. And that is the electron group geometry and molecular geometry are the same. No lone pairs on there. If there is a lone pair, then uh, the molecular geometry would be bent. And just as an, as, off, as an aside here, back to the formal charges. Like the formal charges for all of these are zero, right? Borons in group three, so three minus... Uh, half of six, so three minus three minus zero is zero. Each fluorine would be um, seven minus one, six minus six is zero. So that's will be good. I mean, some students say, no, no, you gotta, you gotta have the octet rule satisfied. Well, really? Here, I'll just go back to the Lewis diagram. I don't have to show it angled here because this is just a Lewis diagram. So if I made a double bond here, first of all, I have to make sure I have 24 electrons, right? 6, 12, 18, 22, 22, 24, 6, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, right? We have the same number of electrons. Well, the fluorine on the left and the right is each going to have a formal charge of uh, 7 minus 1 minus 6 is 0. The fluorine at the bottom is going to be 7 minus 2, which is 5 minus 4, will be plus 1. And the boron would be minus one. And that's just weird. First of all, fluorine is more electronegative, so it should have a negative formal charge compared to the boron. And uh, this basically shows you this is not a real contributor to the resonance structure of uh, boron trifluoride. So the electron deficient, deficient system, electron deficient is the better representation. So once you get that, then you start doing the counting and uh, everything works fine. Okay? So, uh, we talked about that one. So, 2 is linear, 3 is trigonal planar. Um, I think we're going to look at some molecular geometries. Well, actually, let's look at that um, now. Let's look at SO2 before we go to uh, 5. Um, let's sneak in sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide, and we actually looked at this before in terms of a Lewis diagram. We have a lone pair there and here and here. So the number of electron groups, the double bonds, each double bond counts as one, so it's two, and then another one for the lone pair, so three, which is broken up, has two plus one. Each double bond is one bond group and then a lone pair. So that means if there's three groups that the egg is trigonal planar, the molecular geometry cannot be trigonal planar though, because we don't have a uh, atom bonded to the sulfur. So the molecular geometry is, uh, is bent. We say it's bent off of 120 degrees. Or some people just say bent, but I like to say bent off of 120 degrees because that reminds me, this is how you remind me of who I really am. Is that Nickelback? I don't know. Um, Nickelback, that would be a good name for a band that likes their chemistry. 
Okay, uh, so we would have here the electron group geometry is trigonal planar, but there's no atom at the top, so the molecular geometry is bent, and you would see that that angle OSO would be a little less than 120 degrees because that lone pair would squeeze those bonding groups a bit closer together. Okay, um, and you don't roll a 3 get with a 1 and a 2. It's either 3 and 0 or 2 and 1. We showed with 4, it's 4 and 0, 3 and 1, or 2 and 2. And now we get to some larger ones. Now sometimes in grade 12, we don't get to these larger systems. We stop at the tetrahedron. But in this course, we look at steric number 5 and uh, steric number 6. So steric number 5 is what's known, this is a cool one, as the trigonal bipyramid. And again, ask uh, for a grad gift. Ask your friends and family for a Molly Mod molecular model kit. They're made of plastic, and we have some in the schools that hopefully we can use one day. Um, so there's two parts to it. Here's it's two pyramids, one pyramid kissing up against the other, and uh, the base is a triangle, not a square, but a triangle. So the E stands for equatorial, think of it as like a globe. So there's the equatorial, oh, there's equatorial Guinea, there's Ecuador, there's some other thing with an E around the equator. And then we have the axial, A is for axial, like the North Pole and the South Pole. So it's as if uh, the trigonal planar and the linear had a baby, this would be their baby, this is as much biology as I know, uh, equatorial and axial regions, okay? And so if I look at phosphorus trichloride, here's just the Lewis diagram of it, just uh, you see that you have uh, phosphorus is 5, each chlorine is 7, so 35 and 5, 40 electrons, 5 bond groups, no lone pairs, and so the, we say the electron group geometry is the same as the molecular geometry, which is called a trigonal bipyramid. Okay, and there's a nice uh, picture of it. And you can go on YouTube and just type in Vesper animations and you can find all sorts of beautiful ones. Or uh, I've curated some of these videos, and uh, they're in actually the grade 12 website, uh, tinyurl.com slash vmchem. So you can look for those if you'd like, or find your own. Um, now I can take away one of those ligands and get something like this. This is sulfur tetrafluoride. Okay, sulfur tetrafluoride. Here's the Lewis diagram for it. The octet rule is out the window for the central atom. Question is, where do I put this lone pair electron on the sulfur. Do I put it in a uh, axial position or do I put it on an equatorial? Does it matter? Yeah, it does matter. The egg, I mean, I've got four bond groups and one long, uh, lone pair around the central atom. So the egg is still trigonal bipyramid. Those blobs, those five blobs, try to get away from each other as much as possible. So this uh, uh, no, I don't want to write that. Um, let me just let me just get rid of that altogether. I know that the egg is trigonal uh, by pyramid. Yeah, that's even labeled wrong. I don't know what the heck that is. Uh, the the egg is trigonal by pyramid. TBP. So the egg is TBP. The molecular geometry is what's called a seesaw. Okay, the lone pair on the central atom goes in the equator because that allows it more room to spread out. Okay, you're trying to get as more state as, as much you're trying to get as much stability as you can. So you put it in the equatorial region to give it more room. You don't cram it in the axial region. So there's going to be less repulsions this way than if it's in the axial one uh, because you'd have the two and two as opposed to three and then one there. So this more stable isomer is the seesaw form, not the one where it's high up. 
and it's explained there for you. You see that it looks like a seesaw. A structure is more stable when the lone pairs are placed as far as possible from other lone pairs. And that's what that happened there. So the uh, lone pairs always occupy the equatorial position. If there's one lone pair, yes, two lone pairs, even three lone pairs. Okay, let's look at this example 614 where the egg electron group geometry is still a trigonal bipyramid, but the molecular geometries, the first one is T-shaped and the second one is linear. Okay, so in our book, we're on page uh, 614, or page 284. Okay, and uh, we have ClF3, so you have two lone pairs on the chlorine, right? The fluorine, chlorine bonds are uh, single bonds, and uh, so we're going to have 21, 28 electrons there. So 6, 12, 18, 20, 22, 24, and then we got the two lone pairs, so one and Top of chlorine on the bottom, fine, just to draw it, so that's 28. So you see uh, 5 is my nu is my number of Vesper groups, or number of electron groups. So I've got three bond groups and two lone pairs. So the two lone pairs go into an axis, okay, 120 degrees from each other, and then you put another one in the same axis, and then the other two fluorines, you have them uh, as axial, okay? Um the CLF3 is T-shaped with two equatorial line pa lone pairs. Sometimes it's called distorted T-shape. It's actually a T on its edge, isn't it? Uh, but it's called a T-shape, and if I tilt it 90 degrees, it'll look more like a T. And then uh, they want us to do the iodide one, and I think that's done right here for you. So here's the iodide one. It still has five groups around it, but it turns out uh, in I3 minus. So when I draw it, here, let's just draw the Lewis diagram for it. Okay, um, so we're going to have, and I have to have one more, right? It's I3 minus, so it's going to be. 3 times 7 is 21, and one more is 22. So 6, 12, 18, 20, uh, 6, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, then 22. So there gives my 3 around there, and you see that those three lone pairs go on the central atom in an equator. So it's interesting because this is a linear molecule, um, but there's lone pairs around the central atom, so it's not like when there's three atoms without any lone pairs, like carbon dioxide, which was also linear. So this is linear and there are lone pairs. So that's interesting. Uh, getting back to these ones here, SF4, so the bond angle here is going to be a little less than 120, and the bond angle here is going to be a little less than 180. So the lone pair pushes all the other stuff, squeezes it closer together. Uh, same story here with that, that the angles would get squeezed in more between axial and equatorial. Okay, so this uh, lesson plan basically uh, writes itself because uh, we're now up to the last uh, configuration, which is the octahedron. That's eight faces all triangular faces, all with the same surface area. Very nice uh, geometry. If you have one of those molecular model kits, spin it. It spins for a long time when you do it. It's fun. And um, SF6 is an example, sulfur hexafluoride. We have 12 electrons around the central atom, six uh, pairs of electrons. So we have sulfur in the middle, and then we have all these equivalent uh, fluoride. So you can call, if you want, an equatorial region and an axial region, 
but everything's equivalent here. And um, so that's okay if we're sulfur hexafluoride. You have six bond groups, no lone pairs, and that's how that works for sulfur hexafluoride. Uh, here you can replace the fluorine with the chlorine, any place along a z axis, x axis, y axis. So the positions, the six positions of the octahedron are equivalent. Now what's neat is what happens if you don't have six ligands. If you still have uh, a steric number of six, but you have one or two ligands. We won't do more than two ligands. Traditionally, we stop at two ligands. Okay, so um, most molecules are like that. So here's my octahedron, SF6. And in the book, this is on page uh, 286. And um, if here's CLF5. Now, if you draw that out, you still have six groups around the chlorine, but one of them is a lone pair, and the others are bond pairs. So you get what's called the square pyramid, and you see here that it's the first time the pyramid isn't triangular, but it's square. So you got square here, and then you go up to make your square pyramid. So uh, that is one possible molecular geometry if your egg is octahedral. If there's no lone pairs, then your molecular geometry is the same, octahedral. If there is uh, one lone pair, then it's square pyramid. And here in xenon tetrafluoride, there are two lone pairs, and they get as far away from each other as possible, so they're going at the axes. And then you're left with just with a square in the middle, so that's square planar. Okay, let's draw out the Lewis diagrams for CLF5 just so you see how that works. So I got CLF, and then I got a lone pair here. And then I got a fluorine coming out, out, and then going back, and going back. So here I'm actually plastering the Lewis diagram on top of the geometry just to see how it all fits together. Now let's count here. Do I need a calculator? Some kids come out of calculus. Really? I hope you don't need to calculate this math here. I got five fluorines, so that's five times seven is 35, and a chlorine is another seven, so 42. 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42. Octet rule is satisfied for the fluorine. Chlorine's got more than the octet rule. It's got 12 electrons around them, or 6 pairs. Okay. XEF4. So I'm going to have the xenon. We're going to have a fluorine coming out. Another fluorine coming out. Fluorine going back. Another fluorine going back. And then I got a lone pair coming up and a lone pair going down. And then I'm just going to dress up the fluorines. Okay, so that's 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. So 36, uh, 36 electrons all around. So xenon is going to be 8, right? Some of you are freaking out. You're saying, no, it's a noble gas. It can't form bonds. Well, yeah, it can form bonds, and it does. So not that common, but it can. So 8 plus, um, what am I counting up here? 8 plus 4 times 7. I just want to check there. So 28, 36. Is that what we had? 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. And you see how the lone pairs go as far away from each other as possible, 180 degrees to each other, to maximize the stability. That's the whole idea of Vesper. You're trying to get the pairs of electrons as far away from each other as possible to maximize the stability, minimize the repulsions between the pairs. Okay. Um... Oh, then there was a discussion about uh, noble gases reacting in 1962, the year I was born. English chemist working at UBC looked at some things with xenon, which I thought was pretty cool. And uh, good stuff. Okay, so you can read about the history of rare gases. Xenon F4, isn't this the one I just looked at? Yeah, okay. Oh, so it's drawn out for me. There, it's drawn again. Great. Uh, CLF5, isn't that the one we just looked at too? 
Yeah, well, that's a practice exercise, so we already did that. Um, then there's some examples of some other ones uh, you can try. Gallium triiodide. Uh, that is just like... Uh, what's that one just like? That's just like boron triiodide because gallium's in the same uh, group as boron. ASCl4 minus, uh, ASCl4 minus, well, AS, uh, should we try that one? Why not? Why don't we try that one? And then this more challenging one, XeOF4. So let me go to the uh, paint here. And uh, that one was... Section exercise, ASCL4 minus. Let's find everything we can about that. Okay, let's practice the whole Vesper game with ASCL4 minus. Good idea. Okay, this is uh, page 288. So, uh, let's get how many valence electrons there are. Arsenic's going to have 5 because it's a group 5A. Each chlorine is 7. So 5 plus 4 plus, times 7 plus another one. So that's going to be 28 and 6. 34 valence electrons. So I'm going to have AS, then I'm going to just have CLs around them. Here I'm just drawing the Lewis diagram, put a square brackets there with a minus, and then I'm going to dress it up. Okay, 34. So 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. And then another two electrons makes 34. So 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34. So the number of electron groups is going to equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five electron groups, four bond groups, and one lone pair. So if there's five groups, the uh, egg electron group geometry is always trigonal by pyramid. We only have one lone pair here, so the molecular geometry, well, it can't be trigonal by pyramid because there is at least one lone pair. So this is, what the heck was this one called again? Seesaw, right? So if I try to do a perspective sketch, I'll have AS, CL, CL, I'll have the lone pair, and then two other CLs, one going... How did I draw that? Going in, fine, okay. And one coming out. And uh, there are five polar covalent bonds. The chlorine is the negative end in each bond. Uh, polarity of the molecule is something we'll get to in our next topic, but this would be a polar molecule. Okay. So let's try that other example, which is... Uh, XE, I can't see it, XEOF4. Okay, so we're going to have 8 for the xenon, 6 for the oxygen, and 7 for each fluorine. So I get uh, 28 and uh, 36, 42 valence electrons, 28. 34, 42 valence electrons. So I'm going to have xenon, I'm going to have oxygen, then I'm going to have fluorines. Okay, I'm just going to distribute it like this for now. Okay, and then we'll see uh, what happens. Uh, the fluorine is not bonded to the oxygen here. Uh, that's not such a clear thing to see, but uh, I remember this one from somewhere else. So. Uh, that's why I remembered that. So let's put the uh, lone pairs on the fluorine. Okay, and the oxygen. I think it's supposed. To, I think it's going to be a double bond. Forty-two. Let's see. Six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty, thirty-two, thirty-four. Uh, That'll be too much. I think it's going to be a double bond here, and then like this. 42, is that right? Xenon's 8, 
and 6 is 14. And 4 times 7 is 28. 40, 42. Is this 42? 2, 4, 10, 16, 22, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. Ah. So that's not good. Let's try again. 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. But there has to be 42. So, um, well, let's see here. I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Do I have to put another electron on the xenon? No, that's not good. So let's make it a single bond to the oxygen and make this a double bond there. Now will that be 42? 6, 12, 18, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, Okay, so obviously something is challenging about this one. 28. Why am I doing something silly? 28 and 34, 42. Six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. Oh. Okay, and then I'll just put, because that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I'll just put a lone pair on the xenon. There you go. And that uh, satisfies the octet rules for the second row elements, and the xenon can have more than 8 electrons around it, and has 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Okay, so the xenon is going to be our central atom, and 6 is going to be our steric number. 5 bond pairs and 1 lone pair. So uh, this is going to be an egg of an octahedron, and the molecular geometry is square pyramidal. Square pyramid. Okay, so you got xenon, you got a fluorine going out. Sometimes with these perspective sketches, you don't draw the uh, lone pairs on the ligands for the perspective sketches. Okay, well, I am going to draw a lone pair on the xenon, though. That's not a ligand. And then I got an oxygen uh, going up. So that is square planar. Let us uh, look at the section exercises to make sure about that one, because that one you saw took a little bit more ingenuity, uh, 6.4.3 section exercise, and uh, why don't I see the... Well, they decided not to give you the answers to this. Oh yes, here they are. We'll put it on a different page. I didn't see it right. 6.4.3 Steric number six, one lone pair giving square pyramidal geometry with oxygen at the top of the pyramid. Fine. Okay. And the other one was a seesaw. So, good. That was a fun one. Um, now, let's go back to the book here. I want to show you something, a nice summary of what we've done. Properties of covalent bonds, I'll, I'll get to that stuff Uh well, I've talked a bit about it, but I will um, highlight it more next time. Also looking at dipole moments and uh, bond length. So I'll get to that next time. I don't want to throw that in uh, today as well because we've got lots in this uh, topic. But um, let's uh, go to... I just want to show you a table near the end of this uh, chapter. So as I keep sliding down here, I should probably use the page down function, but this is more fun and allows me just to ramble on. Oh, they're really going to talk about bond energy. Okay. Uh, yeah, here you go. Look at this here. Uh, features of molecular geometries, table 6-2. So if you have slept through this entire lecture, well, at least know that you have a chance. It was on page 296. Uh, Table 6.2 summarizes stuff we've talked about. It talks about dipole moment. That, again, I'm going to talk about next time. But you see all the different arrangements. Okay.
So, uh, summary of molecular shapes, what's that? Oh, that's the table. We just talked about that, right? Oh, now I've, now I've discovered page up. Oh, boy. That's good. Um, okay, so... That is the end for this lecture. Sounds good to me. Have fun. Practice.